This week on Arts Insight, a film explores the hidden life of the legendary Tab Hunter. Gee, thanks. I was a product of Hollywood, which was a totally different thing while you were doing it. Handcrafted, intricate, wearable art. I find everything in the process and the material. Looking at something like this, just a pile full of little nothing and seeing a possibility in it. A collection by one of the biggest names in film fashion. The conservative um, aspect of her clothes, the classic timelessness, defines her. An artist who uses a living canvas. It's like a, it's like a painting or something that's hanging on a wall somewhere, but it's on someone's body. And that art lives on forever. And the life lessons of ballet. The wonderful thing about classical ballet training is it prepares a child for any career they pursue. I'm Ernie Manus, and it's time to get arts in sight. Welcome to Arts Insight. Today we're at Memorial Park and you can definitely tell that fall is here. The temperatures are cooler, people are out and about. This is definitely the time of year to be enjoying our city's parks. First up on our show, Tab Hunter was one of America's ultimate heartthrobs in the 1950s and 60s. And he took some time to share with us stories from a new documentary about being one of Hollywood's leading men, but one who had a secret life. You tell me where I could find Tab Hunter. Well, you do pretty good. Gee, thanks. What do you like about Tab Hunter? Well, <laughs> quite a few things. Well, I try not to embellish. I try to really remember the way it was. And if I don't remember, I'll be the first one to say, uh, my age is creeping in here and I don't really remember it. I was actually discovered at the stable before I was in the Coast Guard and went back to New York. And when I was like 12, 13 years old, I was a stable boy on the weekends. I'd hitchhike out to the barn and save all my lunch money so that I could ride a horse. You know, and then work there, you know, shoveling the real stuff. He came along at a very brilliant time. It was the beginning of the teenage revolution in America. I was a product of Hollywood, which was a totally different thing. So you had to learn while you were doing, and that was difficult. But it took a while for me to really get with the program. I never knew I was going to be an actor. I just fell into it. When I count three, will all of the ladies in the audience please go, <sighs> Some of them are studio setup dates, because the studio wants to promote this actress or promote this film or do that. But some of them aren't. Some of them, there's just a premiere and you want to go. Well, of course I want to ask Debbie Reynolds because she's full of hell and a lot of fun to be with. <laughs> After that story that came out in Confidential Magazine, Jack Warner once said to me, I was in, just won the Audience Award as the most popular newcomer, and all of the Warner stars were up there, Natalie and myself, Jennifer Jones, blah, 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 whoever was doing a film there. And um, international press was there, and the guy said, Smile pretty, Tab. This is for the next issue of Confidential Magazine. And I went, uh oh, and I started to turn around. And Jack Warner put his arm around me and turned me back to the audience and said, Just remember this. Today's headlines, tomorrow's toilet paper. <laughs> Hollywood pays tribute to bright new stars of tomorrow. Awards go to blue eyed and blonde Tab Hunter. The publicity exceeded the product. It was all tons of magazine covers, and the popularity was there, but I kept asking myself the question, where do I serve my apprenticeship? Something a matter, kid? That's really important to know your craft. And after a while, I really realized this is something I really want to do. Now, I consider that all my past life. Movies, television, theater, all of that. And I love doing it, but I don't do that any longer. I've been very fortunate. Actor Tab Hunter signs autographs in the time-honored way. I'm very thankful every day. And it's run its course, and I say thank you. And you know, onward and upward. That clean cut on a pencil, Tab Hunter. That all American You can find out more about the film at tabhunterconfidential.com. Moving on, Christine Bossler is a metalsmith and jeweler from Detroit who crafts eclectic works of art from little pieces of nothing. I'm from the east side of Detroit, um, East English Village, neighborhood over by Cadu Cafe and that side of town. My mom, growing up, was very, we're gonna make it from scratch around the house. We made 
wrapping paper, we made our curtains, we made our clothes, we cooked from scratch. So I, I guess it was always kind of there in the background. I find everything in the process and the material. Looking at something like this, just a pile full of little nothing and seeing a possibility in it, that's that to me is like probably the most rewarding thing. Although I really enjoy watching um, how people interact with my work and knowing that it's all handmade and that the metal is clean and pure. It's not plated plastic or glass. It's real. Those things just make me really happy to know that uh, I can do it and that people like it. A lot of stuff that I do has recycled components and I will use broken plates from neighbors, bricks from, from my yard, rusted metal that I find on the street, a whole variety of sources. It, it literally is looking at textures and pattern and rearranging spikes, little pokey texture and playing with process, drilling holes, filing little spikes, soldering them all in there, playing with them between straight and curved. I'm in Boston Edison, Detroit. Technically, I'm south of Boston Edison, but it's still part of the neighborhood. I spend all my time here. I think it's a per perseverance that you see in the streets and in the neighborhoods that really is the inspiration in the studio. Being your own business person isn't easy. Being an artist isn't easy. And yeah, it's, it's kind of a luxury, you know, to be able to have the opportunity to work for yourself and it to me looking at people on the block and the struggles they're going through this it reminds me how lucky I am to keep pushing there's a lot of supporting industry here being that we are a manufacturing town the history of the city being so deep in manufacturing I like working in recycled metals. I think people like that. I think people like the recycled material and that I'm, I try to be clean and ethical. And mining's a really dirty process. There's so much floating around that's being recycled all the time. There's no, if there was a need, that would be another story, but there really isn't. To know that I'm putting wedding rings on fingers and that those rings are going to be there probably for the rest of their lives. Knowing that you're you're a major part of a, some sort of ceremony, a commitment ceremony or a wedding ceremony is pretty neat. I've been really enjoying the cufflinks. There's a lot of process involved. There's a lot of um, a lot of steps. All right, so we're going to get started here. Um, the first thing we do when we're making cufflinks or when I make cufflinks is to build out the wall section, which is uh, this part right in here, or on these, this part right in here. I'm constantly thinking in my head, like, how can I refine this and make it better? And I, I really like doing the different um, moving components. For me, that's, that's a really neat aspect. So what we're doing is we're fitting the hinges so now we're sending the wire through and that's going to be what makes all the joints pivot. I work with on these couplings from stock so we're looking at pre-made wire like this is where we're going to start and um, we're going to make a whole bunch of different components. We're going to do wrap the walls and cut the walls open and then solder them together and then we're going to cut some discs for the base and then we'll stamp them with the hallmarks so that everybody knows that it's sterling silver and it'll have my maker's mark and I like to include a Detroit mark on it so they know where everything's from. After that we'll solder the walls to the base and then turn them over and solder a little peg on to connect the arm hardware and then we'll turn around and make all the arm hardware and the swivels and then clean them up. So this is it. This is, you know, it before we figure out what we're inserting. It could be a lot of things. Um, I have a drawer full of things over here for us to look at if you want. Bicycle tires, records, bricks, slate, sandstone, agate, ceramic. If you can do it here, you can do it anywhere. Detroit is 
in my mind, some of the, the, the harshest critics, like it, they will tell you if what you're making is bad. They'll tell you if it doesn't fit. They'll tell you how you should have done it. So if you can make your business work here, you know, you know you're, you're doing something right. You can do it anywhere you want. Outside my small jewelry business, I, I do make larger one-of-a-kind pieces uh, for the runway and different types of different scenarios. And a lot of that work tends to look at fashion in a critical way. I think it's good for everybody to take a, a look and see how, what they wear and why they wear it and how that applies to our culture now and, and previous to and other cultures, how it's related. Find out more at christinebossler.com. Now, someone who knew how to use jewelry to accent a wonderful outfit, Edith Head is one of the most recognizable names in film fashion history. During her 60-year career, she worked on more than a thousand films, designed many iconic costumes worn by some of Hollywood's biggest stars, and in the process garnered 35 Academy Award nominations. I grew up in Lancaster in the 40s, and I loved the movies. Went every Saturday. And the names I remember are Wally Westmoreland, who did the makeup, and costume design was always Edith Head. She was uh, at Paramount for 34 years, which is unprecedented. And it's, it's definitely not just a show of evening gowns, but of all of the genres of the films that she worked on. And her other interests, she was one of the first women to brand herself. So we talk about her creating dress patterns and the books she wrote, in addition to the costumes that she designed. Her name, I think, was the most well-known of all of the uh, costume designers in Hollywood. And her name, she's been, she's been dead since 1981, and her name still comes up. Um, I think in The Incredible, she's, <laughs> she's referred to. The conservative um, aspect of her clothes, the classic timelessness, defines her. A movie could be uh, kept for release for a couple of months, sometimes a year, even two years after it was made, before it was released. So she strictly avoided any fads in clothing because when the movie was released, it would look dated. One of the most recognizable ones would be the, the wedding dress. It's, uh, it's very elaborate and in remarkable condition for its age. And it reminds me that all of these costumes in this exhibition were once in the rental stock of Paramount Pictures. Until 2006, anyone could go in and rent these costumes. These clothes haven't traveled except for one exhibition in El Paso, Texas, and that was a town that had a film festival. And for their 100th anniversary, they reached out to Paramount um, for an Edith Head collection. And so th all of these costumes were uh, restored. Uh, some of them had been very badly damaged, but they've been restored beautifully. So they were on exhibition there in 2012 and went back Paramount, and when our application was approved, um, they, they're here, and this is just the second time that they've ever left Hollywood. We have a little bit of everything uh, from Bing Crosby's jacket and uh, Martha Ray's cape when she was a matador in a movie for something like 30 seconds. <laughs> and. Uh, Bob Hope's circus co costume, 
there are some very sophisticated uh, evening dresses. There's a negligee. And there are some performance costumes like the Jane Russell uh, outfit that, and a Betty Hutton outfit that sequins that were used in performance scenes in the movie. Her personal style, and this was her career persona, was conservative suits, usually gray. The uh, school marm sort of old-fashioned school marm bangs and hair she adopted in 1938 when she became chief designer at Paramount. She created this look. It was the bangs, the chignon, and the glasses. The blue lenses in her glasses, she said, enabled her to see what the colors would look like in black and white film. And as soon as they started making more color pictures, she switched to gray. The biggest secret of her success was she studied the scripts. She knew exactly what the storyline was and she wanted the costumes to advance the storyline. She also asked the artists about their preferences. Some of them wouldn't wear prints. Some of them had what they considered figure flaws, which we never noticed because Edith was such a genius at covering them up. For instance, she said Betty Davis had a thick neck <laughs> and she had a very big bust, which was suffering from the effects of gravity. <laughs> and Betty wouldn't wear an underwire bra because she thought they caused cancer. <laughs> so she was a genius. She said, except for Grace Kelly, every actress had something that needed disguised. Seeing them in the movies is, is one thing, and we even have clips from the movies here. But to see the fabrics and the incredible handwork, the beading and the soutaching, uh, it just defies description, and you it's not something you see in the mall <laughs> or in a department store anywhere. This is the only place, and these are incredible works of art. They truly are. For details on another Edith Head exhibit coming in 2016, visit DeckArtsOhio.org. For thousands of years, they've been used for self-expression and remembrance. Whether you personally love them or hate them, you can't help but notice this art form. For me as an artist, it's just about being different. It's a uniqueness, a style that every artist will have, and they'll find, you know, whether it be whatever passion they have, whatever medium. Hey. Hey. You're free to apply? Yes. All right. He's already set up for you. Go on back. Thank you. That's Sacks on the left. Hi. Hi. Tattooing is unlike anything else um, in the art world um, because of the fact that you have so many things, so many variables to count in for. Things go hand in hand with things like oil painting, blending colors. Like the way you do that is like the same thing how you smooth out blends in a tattoo. Um, doing watercolor stuff is the same idea because you're going from light to dark with that and then certain things you have to do just to break down the idea of a tattoo. The industry has changed the machines, ink, people in the industry, I mean just all of us. In the like late 90s, it was just starting to get popular again but it was still the whole stigma on bikers, drug dealers, gangsters, prisoners, like that kind of thing still. It's like every walk of life. I mean, you couldn't even pick the people that come off the street anymore. You think someone's coming in here for a piercing or something like that, the exact opposite. There's still that little bit of a closed minded which, you know, unfortunately it's gonna happen. It's always gonna be there in society. I got a chance to actually have a a live canvas, you know, a walking canvas. I mean, we just bring that imagination to them and create something for them to have on their skin. You know, there's a lot of aspects that will go into it. Uh, body placement, size, 
um, especially the location, the house may fit somebody's body correctly. You need to make sure the design is going to complement that area because it's our job to take a two-dimensional image on a piece of paper and you need to have it flow with their body. You can't just do one thing on somebody and do it on the next 20 people. It's always something different. You always have to be on your toes to change and do things to make sure that that tattoo is what it should be. A lot of people sometimes come in with ideas and then sometimes they don't know what they want. So what I do is I ask questions. You know, what is it that you like? What do you like? What are you about? You know, who are you? You know, what's your favorite thing or, you know, quote or whatever. Just try to get to know the client. If you see a smile, you know. You know from that moment that you home run the tattoo because every person is going to have that overwhelming sense of joy. A close friend of the family, her dog passed away. That was probably the most memorable. We did a portrait of the dog. Her name's Tippy. That hit me really close because it was one of the first clients that, you know, when she saw it, she cried and she was happy and was going to be able to have the thing that she loved forever with her. But every person that walks out of here, you know, that's that's my billboard. And one of the truest, you know, philosophies when it's come to tattooing is you're only as good as your last one that you did. It's like, a, it's like a painting or something that's hanging on a wall somewhere, but it's on someone's body. And that art lives on forever. For more information, visit SacramentoTattooShops.com. And finally tonight, the Miami City Ballet is a well-established dance company in South Florida, enriching the arts community and the local youth. We're on Miami Beach, which is really wonderful, built especially for dancers. From three years old all the way till 19 years old, we have classes in ballet, modern, and jazz, all kinds of dance classes. The, the top levels in the school are part of what we call a pre-professional division, which means these are serious dance students, both male and female, that are vying to get a position in this company or another professional company around the country or the world. And they're training six days a week, very intense. People don't realize how difficult ballet is. You know, we work very hard. People, a lot of time, just come to see the show. And a lot of them don't realize that to see a beautiful show like they saw, it's a year of work with the frustration, the injuries, and all those things that happen. Working at it every day, it's definitely something like sometimes we put it all the tension in our face and we're like like looking at ourselves in the mirror like this is so hard but then you have to just look like beautiful ballerina and make it look easy and that takes a lot of practice to get to that point the wonderful thing about classical ballet training is it prepares a child for any career they pursue because it teaches them discipline self-esteem, an incredible work ethic. They learn time management. They learn respect for their peers and their teachers and their directors. Well, you have to be disciplined to be a ballerina because you sit there and you do the same thing every day, even though you think about different things every day, but you do the same thing every day. And that takes a lot of like, it's kind of a mind game, I think. So being out in the real world, anything you do, being a ballerina, even if you're sitting at a desk all day, like you've been through that mind game and you push yourself every day and I think that helped me in any job in the future. We are so committed to creating a strong male dance program. So we have scholarships that we offer to young boys uh, ages seven, eight, nine, ten years old who haven't had any training before. They come and audition and if they show a proclivity for dance and movement, musicality, you know, a flair for performance, then we bring them on board and we train them. The athletic part of the competition, I think, is a big boost for men. You know, when they are in the class and they see that, you know, friends are pushing and turning more and jumping higher. And there is a nice, healthy competition uh, with, with, with men. We're so pleased to have some of the best instructors in the world here teaching these, these students. And the South Florida community should feel so proud to have such an incredible training program right here on Miami Beach producing these beautiful young dancers that are going on to professional careers. For more information, visit MiamiCityBallet.org. And that does it for this episode of Arts Insight. Make sure you get out and enjoy your city parks. For all of us at Houston Public Media, I'm Ernie Manous. Thanks for watching and have a great week.